You're listening to the sermon podcast from Meadowbrook Church in Cheyenne, Wyoming with Pastor Keith Miller. All right, we're going to be reading from Ezra 3, verses 10 through 13. Um, Will you please stand up while we read through the scripture, Lord? Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to to praise the Lord, according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for... His favor is upon Israel forever, and all the people shouted with a great shout of joy when they praised the Lord. Because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid, yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' households, the old men, the old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of, his, of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of weeping of the people, because the people were shouting with with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. Well, how's everybody? Good. I'm doing well, too. I'm glad to be preaching again. This is kind of another filler sermon. I I said the the last, I don't know if you missed it, many of you were here for it. Uh, Two weeks ago, I preached a sermon titled, the, four, the three F words of the Christian life. If you missed it, go back and find out uh, what I said. Uh, and I, I said, you know, it was kind of a... That sermon, I felt, served as a linchpin between, between the Malachi series and the Advent series that we'll be getting in, in about two weeks. Uh, this, is, this has that same feel to me. I was... I was at a conference, uh, many of you know that, with the staff. It was a leadership training conference. It was in Arizona. And I listened to a breakout session, and the the guy who uh, spoke and kind of led that session just highlighted Ezra chapter 3. And I, as I listened to him, I thought, wow, I, you know, I've, I've read Ezra before, but I never really thought that deeply about Ezra. And so that kind of sent me down the rabbit hole, so to speak, to dive deep into Ezra chapter 3 and to Ezra as a book. And, and it, it, the, the interesting thing about that is, about Ezra, is that this is in the same like, context of Malachi. So Ezra you know, kind of oversaw the, 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 the reforms and, and um, was kind of a, he was a part of the building of the temple. And Nehemiah, which is the next book, Nehemiah, he oversaw the building of the walls in Jerusalem. This is after the exile. And Malachi arrived somewhere on the scene, somewhere after the temple was built. Uh, maybe he knew Ezra, maybe he didn't. Uh, but Malachi, as you remember, was dealing with like, worship. And what does it mean to worship this God that we, that we say that we, that we worship and that we believe in? And so uh, Ezra just fits so nicely in that. And, and and in light of where we're going with the Advent series, uh, this is so fitting. This is so fitting. And so I, I want to, what I want to do is, <laughs> I like, how many of you like sandwiches? I, hoagies. Hey, you know, by the way, Eagles keep winning. <laughs> There's hoagies in your future. Um, <laughs> so I'm just saying, uh, Philadelphia hoagies. <laughs> and, and, Anyway, uh, I don't want to get sidetracked, but I am pretty stoked about tomorrow's game. All right, I'm an Eagles fan, for those of you who don't know. Most of you know that. But you like sandwiches, right? Well, yeah, Ezra, Ezra chapter 3, for me, I, if, if, if I could picture, picture, Ezra chapter 3 is kind of like the, 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 the ingredients in between the bread. What I want to do for you is to get a whole, the whole picture, I want to, I want to show you how, how we get to Ezra chapter 3, which is a really important chapter in the Bible, and, and why that's important. That will be the other side of the sandwich, so to speak. Uh, and to get there, I'm going, to talk about the, I'm going to talk about the temple and the glory of God. And that's, going to be kind of, that's what you're going to hear throughout this, this sermon. And it's really important. It's really important. And I think it will make... It, well, one, I, I do think that you'll leave here encouraged. I do think that you'll leave here helped. Uh, this is not a history lesson on 
the temple, although it, you'll get a glimpse of like why that was so important, why, why these people, some of them rejoiced at the building of this new temple, and some of them uh, just lamented, they, were just, they, they, they wept uh, because of the previous temple, Solomon's temple, which I have pictures, and it will be a multimedia event today. Uh, but but uh, I, I want to do that to help you understand why this is so important and why it fits so well with Advent, why it fits so well with another glory that came, which we'll talk about a little later. So I love the way the Bible begins. Uh, you know, I've started using the New American Standard, the updated New American Standard version of the Bible. We're actually, I ordered, uh, they're still called Pew Bibles, by the way, even though we have chairs. I ordered Pew Bibles so we'll have both the ESV and the New American Standard for those of you who don't, you know, maybe have a Bible. That's next week. But I love the way the New American Standard begins, translates the very opening verses of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a formless and desolate emptiness. I love, I love the way it, 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 the translators uh, did that with the Hebrew. The desolate emptiness and darkness was over the, fa- the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. That's the way Genesis begins. And you know the story. Uh, the first six days of, of creation, which I believe really happened and I believe it literally happened and that's okay if you don't, uh, but I believe it happened. Like in, those, in those days, God, God did something amazing. He spoke into existence that which did not exist. And on the sixth day, he made man in his own image. We're told, in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. That's us. Uh, That was Adam and Eve. And he told, you remember, uh, he told Adam and Eve, look, uh, he said to Adam, you can manage all the garden. Manage it, take care of it. You can eat from every tree except for one. And if you eat from that tree, you'll surely die. Uh, if you want all the details, just read Genesis chapter 1 uh, and chapter 2. But, but that's what happened. Here's what I want to say to you that probably some of you may have never heard this before. Did you know that the Garden of Eden was the first temple that the presence of God dwelt in? The, the tabernacle and the temple that Solomon built were a, a model of that. Did you know that? And in, in Revelation, when the, at the end of the Bible, guess what, guess what we have? We have the presence of God, and it, it kind of looks like a temple, and we get to see him face to face, and he will wipe away our tears from, every, you know, from, from our tear-stained eyes. That's how the Bible ends. This is how the Bible begins in, in, in Genesis chapter 1. Yet the presence of God was, at the, was in the center of, 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 of Eden. And God said, look, you, you, I want you to worship me, and, and I want you to manage the garden, and I also want you to be fruitful and multiply. That's the first command, to be, to be disciple makers. Fill the earth with Yahweh worshipers. This is all in Genesis. It's, it's pretty staggering. And he said, but if you leave from that tree, and you're choosing a lesser glory. You're choosing an idol over me. You're choosing death over life if you eat from this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which um, uh, Ben did such a great job last week just unpacking that. Eden was the very first temple. So just, I just want you to hear that. I'm, I'm not going to go into all the, the details, but what happened to Adam and Eve? Well, they sinned against God. What did God do? He drove them out of Eden. Remember that? And what did he set to guard Eden, from then going back into Eden to eat from the tree of life. A cherubim, an angel, a type of angel. He did that. Uh, before, he, before he drove them out of Eden, he made them a promise. He said to the serpent, and really the, as he was speaking to the serpent, as God spoke to the serpent, he promised Adam and Eve something. He said, and I will make enemies of you and the woman and your offspring and her descendant. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Uh, theologians call this like the first gospel, the first proto-evangelion. This is the first gospel. And, uh, and then all the Bible is unpacking that promise um, with, with every chapter that follows. So that's the, that sets the stage. 
Then if you go, now, so this is my first, my, my first point, Israel enjoyed an ancient glory. There's about 2,500 years between Adam and Moses. And so now we're fast-forwarding to Moses. So we're, we're bypassing all kinds of stuff that happened in between uh, Abraham and all those guys. Uh, 2,500 years, you, we find this guy by the name of Moses. And Israel is in, is in bondage in the wilderness, or not in the wilderness, in Egypt. And they were there for like 400 years. And God pro, pro, told or prophesied, said to or foretold to Abraham, your descendants would be in Egypt for, for 400 years, and then I will deliver them back into this land. And he did that. They will, they will serve as slaves. Listen to this, right? They will, they will labor for 400 years. So then they're in Egypt. God delivers them, and he does it through Moses. And it's amazing. So you know, the, the ten plagues and some crazy things that God did, and he parted the, the Red Sea as he delivered his people through, uh, through the parted sea, it looks like the birth canal, into a new land. This is, I mean, it's, it's crazy. And so what does God, how does God lead? How did, how did he lead his people from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, you know, eventually to the promised land? a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So they find themselves on Mount Sinai. Well, they, Moses is on Mount Sinai. Israel is surrounded, you know, they're at the base of Mount Sinai. And God tells them, he says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. And, I, and I, what God was telling through Moses, telling Israel, you're going to serve in the same capacity Adam was called to serve. You're going to be my priests before the nations. And I want you to represent me before the nations. The goal never changed. The, the mission never changed. Fill the earth with Yahweh worshipers people who worship Yahweh. Israel, you're going to be my kingdom of priests. You're going to represent me before the nations, and I will make my presence with you. And so later on, God tells Moses in Exodus chapter 25, he says, I want you to build a tabernacle. This is how I want you to do it. And you can read all about the details as to how they're to do it. Uh, but he said this, have them construct a sanctuary for me, so that I may dwell among them according to all that I am going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furniture, so you shall construct it. What does the tabernacle remind all of Israel of? What was, what was true of Eden before the fall. And God's presence was there. His glory manifested itself in, within the tabernacle. Where was the tabernacle to be set up? At the center of of, of all of Israel as they were journeying and, 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 and functioning as exiles until they entered into their own uh, land that God had promised them. Uh, the tabernacle would serve as the center of worship for all of Israel. So this is what it, you know, this is what we think it looked like <laughs> based on what we read in the Bible. Go to the next slide. This is, this is kind of what it looked like inside. There was the Ark of the Covenant. Don't think Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know. Uh, you know, like if people touch it, their skin melts off, and, you know, that's, don't, don't think that. Um, but only certain people were, were allowed to touch it. What were on the top of the, the what were uh, fastened to the Ark or around the Ark were images of the cherubim. Um, I could spend a whole sermon on this. I won't, but I just, I just want you to see this. So they would have to tear this thing down and then set it back up every time they made camp and every time they tore down camp. Do you know, you, do you know what, what, when they would do this? When the cloud led them by day, they would tear down the camp and they would follow the cloud. And when the cloud or the pillar of fire stopped, that's where they would set up camp. And then, the, and then this would go back up, the tabernacle. Remember that word, tabernacle. Um, we're going to get back, we're going to get to that in a little bit. 
So, so that happened. Now, let's fast forward another 500 years after Moses died. You have a guy by the name of David who, who pops up on the scene. And he is the king but to whom all other kings are compared. He is, he is known as a man who, who's, uh, who had a heart after God's own heart. Uh, he, was a, he was a flawed man, but he was a man that God promised. He was from the tribe of Judah. He said, through your, through your gene pool, uh, David, there will be a descendant from you who will sit on your throne and will reign forever and ever. And well, one of the things David wanted to do is he wanted to build, a, he wanted to take the, let's go back to the tabernacle real quick. He wanted to take this and make it look like, go back, okay, good, uh, in Jerusalem. He wanted to build this, but God said, you know what? You're not allowed to build this. You can, you can get all the materials for it if you'd like, but you're not allowed to build this because your hands are stained with blood, David. You are a warrior. You're a man of war. Now, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. God called him to that, but he said, he said, your son can build a temple in your stead. And so Solomon was known for, as being a king of peace. So Solomon built this temple. And uh, it, it probably looks somewhat like this. You have the cherubim, you have trees, you have animals. kind of looks like the Garden of Eden inside. Um, so then <clears throat> Solomon, so David dies. Solomon winds up becoming king. Solomon prays for wisdom. He says, I want to lead your people. And God's like, okay, that sounds great. I'm going to bless you with wisdom. He becomes, he, 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 Solomon becomes known as a, one of the wisest man uh, you know, you know, in the region. People would go to see him and, and, and visit with him like leaders. Uh, he was wise. He wrote Proverbs. He wrote Ecclesiastes. He wrote Song of Solomon, most likely. He, he, he wrote those. David wrote the Psalms, the songbook of the Bible. Solomon wrote the, the wisdom literature, uh, much of the wisdom literature in the Bible. These were, these were uh, men that God used in amazing ways, but deeply flawed men. God said to uh, Solomon when the temple was, was, uh, was built and they dedicated it, he said this. Uh, he said, if you turn away and abandon my statutes and my commandments, which I set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot you from my land, which I have given you, and this house, which I have consecrated for my name. I will cast out of my sight, I will cast out of my sight. And I will make it a proverb and an object of scorn among all peoples. As for this house, which was, which was exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done these things to this land and to this house? And they will say, because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them from the land of Egypt, and they, abandoned other God, or, or, and they adopted other gods and worshipped and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this adversity on them. You know what happened with Solomon, right? Solomon was told, I, I, I only read a small excerpt of what God said to Solomon. He said, you know, you, you serve me in the way your father served me. You keep your eyes on me like the way your father kept his eyes on me, Solomon. Because if you go after other gods, it, it will not go well. One of the things that Solomon was known for is that he loved many what? foreign women. And uh, the, the interesting thing about that is Solomon knew his Bible. I mean, he wrote books that were in our Bibles, right? That are in our Bibles. He knew what Exodus said. He knew Exodus chapter 34, verse 16. You shall not enter into marriage with foreign women, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And the foreign women God was speaking of was the women who, who, who were, you know, worshipped these other gods. It was okay to to marry women, a certain group of women who worshipped Yahweh, but not these women. And so what did Solomon do? He, because he was like, well, I'm, I'm a man of peace, and this is the way the other nations do it, so I'm just going to bring wives uh, into my family from these other nations, wives who worshipped other gods. And so what happened to Solomon? His heart was turned away from the Lord. And he set the stage for rampant idolatry in all of Israel. All of this happened before Ezra. So and you know the story, God judged uh, Israel as a, as a whole. They were, they were exiled in two different, like, 
sections of the, of the country. The Assyrians dealt with the northern part of the country. The Babylonians dealt with the southern part of the country. And it was ugly. Um, it was really ugly. Babylon came because you had the temple, Solomon's temple, you had on the southern part of the country called Judah. And Babylon came, they besieged Jerusalem, and you know what, what happened? You know what happened to Solomon's temple? It was leveled. And there's this, there's this interesting passage in Ezekiel, you can read it sometime, Ezekiel chapter 10, where it talks about the time where God's glory left the temple, like it departed. That, that thing that, was, that, that demonstrated like, like God is in it with, with his people, they're able to, to be with him and have a relationship with him. There came a time where, where God disciplined his people, but then his glory left the temple. It left the temple. And that sets the stage for Ezra. Like there are, there, the, the problem of Adam and Eve and, and every example that I just shared with you, the like bad example that I shared with you of like what not to do, examples of what not to do, is an example of people who chased after lesser glories. Adam and Eve chased after, you know, this idea that they could be like God. Israel made a golden calf. <laughs> Like shortly after, God said, you'll be my kingdom of priests. Like shortly after that, they made a golden calf. It was a lesser glory. Uh, that is their story. And when we come to Ezra, we learn that the people were pursuing a new glory. That's my second point. This is, this is, this is where the lessons kind of come in. This is where, like if we're not paying attention, we can, miss, we can miss the point. After hundreds of years in exile and and the desperate prayers of, of, of the Hebrew people, for like 70 years they were in exile. God was doing something. He was stirring in the hearts of leaders. He was moving history. Uh, and, and, and so when you, so if you have a Bible, you want to be in Ezra, I think it would be good for you to see some of these things. Use your digital device. But I, I want you to see this because it's, this is a good reminder for us all, especially when you're, uh, when you feel like you're, 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 you're suffering and there's no end to your suffering or you're so discouraged because nothing's going right or, or your, your heart is just grieved over whatever right now, this is really good for you to see right now today what we see in Ezra. The, 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 the plan has always been that God would dwell with his people. Always, from the beginning. And so Ezra, you know, we comes on the scene and he records uh, some things that were happening you know, in, in, behind the scenes that, that it would have been impossible for these exiles who are in Babylon, who are in other places of, uh, of the world, who thought that maybe God gave up on them. They didn't know that God was doing something in their midst. And so when you come to Ezra chapter 1, the very first verse, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. So you have the most powerful person on planet Earth right now, just hanging out, maybe like in his chamber or whatever. He is a pagan. He worships other gods. He doesn't worship the god of the Hebrews, but he's known for something. And what is he known for? He's known for allowing the exiles or people groups that he, that he was responsible for conquering or other empires were responsible for conquering before him. He, is known, he, he became known for allowing them to go back into their homeland, or at least a portion of them, and to start rebuilding. So here you have this pagan king, Cyrus, and he's hanging out, and God stirs in his heart. This is what it says. In order to fulfill the word of the Lord. What, word, what, what word of the Lord? Something that Jeremiah wrote while everybody was in exile, where God, you know, God spoke through Jeremiah, and, and God said through the prophet Jeremiah that my people will be in exile for 70 years, and then I will I, I'll make it so that they can return. So, the per, the, so you have this pagan king who doesn't know anything about Yahweh except for what he learned of, from the Hebrew people. He's there, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and, all, and also put it in writing saying this. Basically, this is law now. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. 
the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to rebuild for him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judea, or Judah, I'm sorry, Judah, wherever, or whoever there is among, all, or among you of all his people, may his God be with him, go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And basically, that's what they do. So, so Cyrus, the most powerful guy on planet Earth at that, that, at that point in time, says, go back to Jerusalem. Rebuild the temple. And God did this long before. I mean, he was stirring in the hearts of kings and Cyrus so this would happen. I mean, I think some of you need to hear this. Like, some of you, are, you, you're, you're, you feel like you're treading water and there's no land in sight. There's no end to whatever it is you're going through. And, you're, and you're, you've been pleading with the Lord, when is this going to end? What are you doing in my life? That's the same question the exiles were asking. What are you doing, God? Have you forgotten us? Do, do you re even remember who we are? Behind the scenes, God was moving. And so, chapter 2 is just a bunch of names. We won't <laughs> then we get to chapter 3. They're not just a bunch of names, but... We're not going to get into it. So chapter 3 is the chapter I, just, I want us to focus a little bit of time on. What do the people do? There's so many good things that they do here. <clears throat> In the seventh month, what's the, when, it says, now when the seventh month came, well, what's that? It's probably uh, the Day of Atonement. It's the day where uh, the Hebrew people would make sacrifices to atone for their sins as a nation. Now when the seventh month came and the sons of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one person to Jerusalem. And this wasn't just like a little bit of people. It was like thousands. I, so I, I, I don't know the exact number, but it's probably in the ballpark of, you know, my guess would be, you know, 20, 30, maybe 40,000. I'm not exactly sure, but it's thousands. But it's not as many as, it's not as many people that used to live in Jerusalem before they were disciplined from the, by the Lord, before the exile. But there's a lot of people here. Then uh, Joshua, Joshua, the son of uh, Josadak, yeah, um, and Zer Zerubbabel, and I'm not going to, I'm going to skip a bunch of these names. <laughs> Uh, they're gathering together, and you have the priests there, and they set up the altar, verse 3, they set up the altar on its foundation because they were, listen, look at this, because they were terrified. Who were they terrified of? They were terrified of the peoples of the lands. So they didn't get their <clears throat> spears, and they didn't look for horses, and they didn't look for chariots, they didn't look for any of those things. What did they do? In response to the terror that they felt, they set up the altar. What is the altar? That's the place where you, where, where you offer uh, you know, sacrifices before Yahweh. It is, it is symbolic of their worship of Yahweh. So in, <clears throat> they're surrounded by terrors, and their response is to worship Yahweh. That's, chapter, that's right here in chapter 3. So they also celebrated the Feast of Booths. This is also known as, listen, the Feast of Tabernacles. What is the Feast of Tabernacles? It's a it's festive, it's kind of like a party. I actually went, went to one. I, my friend Ryan, uh, who, led, who was filling in for worship for season here, uh, hosted a uh, Feast of Booths uh, sort of, uh, party at his house. It's like a party. And it was a, they do this, they would do this and it, to remember the way that God protected them and delivered them from, not just from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, but why they are in the wilderness. And it would serve to remind them, every time they celebrated this, it served to remind them of the presence of God. It served to remind them the, uh, of, of his favor upon his people, that he was with them, that he didn't abandon them, that his glory was in their presence. It's, it is really important that you see this. They celebrated the Feast of Booths as it is written, and offered and prescri the prescribed number of burnt offerings daily. So they're worshiping the Lord. 
Uh, verse 6, from the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. So the temple is <clears throat> symbolic of the presence of the Lord. It's, it's to be the center of, uh, of Israel. And it was, it, you know, Solomon's temple was leveled. And so there was no foundation that had been laid. And that's chapter 3. A foundation for the temple needed to be laid. Verse 8, now the, in the second year of, uh, of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, um, they began the work of laying the foundation. They hired masons and, and like, let's get to work. Let's do this thing. All sponsored by the most powerful man in the world, Cyrus. Verse 10. Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in, in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals. What are they doing? They're singing songs. They're singing songs. They're, they're going to worship. They're having a worship service. Like, the band is out. <laughs> and, and they're, they're going to celebrate this God, even though, they're celebra- but the, even though they're surrounded by terrors people who didn't like them, people who wanted them gone, people who wanted them destroyed. Verse 11, and they sang, this is really important, you see this, they sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his favor is upon Israel forever. Now, this is why cross-references are so good, uh, and you should use them. What's so significant about verse 11 here? is they're singing the same song that the priests and all of Israel were singing when Solomon's temple was dedicated. And what you need to know about when when Solomon's temple was dedicated, the glory of the Lord came through the temple and filled the temple, and it was like an amazing, supernatural, mind-blowing event. These exiles are here, and they're getting ready to lay the foundation, and they're, and, they, and they're singing the same song that all of Israel was singing at the dedication of Solomon's temple. And all the people shouted with a great shout of joy when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Verse 12. Yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's, fa- father's households The old men who had seen the first temple, what did they do? They wept. Why did they weep? We're not told exactly why they wept, but my guess is if we go to the temple, let's go. uh, Let's go to. So so this is really pretty. Let's go to the new temple that was eventually built. This is not. (laughs) This is much smaller. Then let's go back to Solomon's temple. This. <laughs> you got gold and you got like all kinds of awesome things. This was destroyed because of Israel's rebellion against God. And this, <clears throat> and this is what they had to settle for. Let's go back to the next slide. That. It's so easy to live in the past. Isn't it? Like, I, like nothing has changed. We, we are... <laughs> We as a species are guilty of doing that. We can be stuck in the past. I think these guys, they're, they're weeping over what was once, what once was, and, and, and they can't get past the beauty of Solomon's temple. The young men, they, they never experienced Solomon's temple, so this is pretty amazing. Like, this is the biggest thing they ever saw. In fact, some of the, remember, it's been 70 years they've been in exile. The young guys, they never saw the temple of the Lord before. They never saw anything like it. They just heard stories. So they celebrated when the, when, when the foundation of this was laid. They celebrated it. They were excited. But the crazy thing to me is, and, I, and, and the question I am asking myself, or as I was, as I was working through the, this, this chapter in Ezra, is were they enamored with what they saw and, and the, the history of their people, or were they longing for a greater glory? You see, the, 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 old, the older guys who saw Solomon's temple, experienced his temple, they were stuck with that glory. 
Like, there's nothing mentioned here about them longing for the presence of God to fill the temple. They're weeping because the, found, the, the, the foundation that's been laid for the new temple is smaller than, the, than Solomon's temple. It doesn't look as glorious. They don't have as much money as, as they did. I mean, when Solomon was king, the, the nation was super wealthy. They have nothing except for what's, what the, the, the king of Persia has allowed them to have. So they weep. And the young men, they celebrate. What are they celebrating over? Because when you read the story here, you've got to ask yourself, they're singing the same song at the de- that was sung at the dedication of, of, of Solomon's temple. They went through the same, kind of, they put together a similar worship service that, that Solomon put together uh, to honor the Lord for the building of the temple. But, uh, but when you read through Ezra, you've got to ask yourself, where is the glory of God? Where is his presence? And it's not there. Um, now, they did all the right things, I think. Uh, they're surrounded by terrors, so what do they do? They worship the Lord in response to that. Nehemiah will come eventually, and he'll build up the walls around Jerusalem. It's really important that you, that you, that you pay attention to the details. And here's what I want to show you, why I think the glory of God wasn't really on their minds, because of the way Ezra... Ends. So if you have your Bible, go all the way, go to chapter 10. <clears throat> this is probably about, um, my guess is, it's probably between 40 to 50 years later. But I think the reason why this last verse is in Ezra is to give us some context for why one group was weeping and another group was celebrating. All of these men had married foreign wives and some of them had wives by whom they had children. Like one chapter, the previous chapter, chapter 9, uh, we learn of how uh, the men married foreign women just like Solomon did because they were prettier because all the other nations were doing it, and it had very little to do with a love for Yahweh, for the God of David. Which leads me to my final point, and this is more like the application. Israel missed a better glory. They missed a better glory. Um, So, you know, how did they miss it? Yeah, they sang the song, He is good, for his favor is upon Israel forever. You know, they they did all the ceremonial stuff. They had a really awesome worship service. The people were engaged. What glory did they miss? They missed the presence of God. I think there were people here who really longed for the presence of God, so I'm not discounting that, but I think they missed it. I think there were a group of people who were just consumed with what was, what's, what was once theirs, and then there's another group that were thinking of what could be theirs, and it had very little to do with God. And, uh, and the same dangers that, 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 faced, that, that, faced, that faced this group of people, these Hebrew people, is the same dangers that face us today. I think the reason why the men turned to foreign women is the same reason Solomon turned to foreign women and they were chasing after a lesser glory. Which begs us to ask the question, what glory are we chasing? Like our own? I I don't think there was any way for Israel to understand exactly what was going on here. Only God knew what was going on. But the reason why he brought Israel back into Judah was because there was a promise made to Adam and Eve. Eve, through your descendant, your descendant will crush the head of the serpent. There was a promise made to Abraham. Abraham, through your descendants, uh, you, you, they will bless the nations because there will be one who will come through those descendants. David, 
Through David, there would be a son who would sit on his throne forever and ever, and he will rule with an iron rod, and the nations will pay homage to him. Like there, was, there was something God was doing here, and, the, and for God to make that happen, Israel needed to be back in Judah. And so he brings them back into Judah. They thought that maybe, you know, maybe by building the temple, maybe the glory of God would fill the temple, or maybe they would have what used to be. Maybe that was the, 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 the mountaintop. Maybe that was the climax of, of the, the experience of the people of God and his presence. Maybe that's what they were thinking, and they couldn't see beyond you know, their, their circumstances and the ruins of Solomon's temple that maybe God was doing something much, much bigger than they could uh, ever imagine. Because even though the glory left the temple, left Solomon's temple, and it never returned, it did eventually return. This is Advent that I'm getting into now. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Let's go there. Speaking of Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. <laughs> this should take your, brain, your, your mind back to Genesis chapter 1, right? And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. And then verse 14 of John chapter 1. See if you can hear overtones of everything I just, we just looked at today. And the word became flesh. And literally, the word means tabernacled. And the word tabernacled. Who tabernacled? God did. In flesh, among us, and we saw his glory, glory as, as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory returned. It returned. It didn't return in Ezra chapter 3. It didn't return in Ezra chapter 6 or Ezra chapter 10 or Nehemiah. Or, or anywhere else, it returned on that first Christmas day where uh, it could be heard in the sound of, a, of, a, of an infant crying, born of a virgin. The glory returned. And <clears throat> I think Israel just never really learned their lesson that you move when God moves and you stay when God stays. You keep your eyes focused on him and trust that he's doing something that you could probably not even wrap your mind around. He's the God of redemption. He takes what is ugly and he, turns it and he transforms it into something beautiful. The point from, since Genesis was not, was not that God would have his, his, you know, a pillar of fire or a cloud by day you know, be the experience of, of Israel for, for, for all of history. The point was all of that pointed to someone. It pointed to a, a greater glory that would come. And I think like for, for us, the danger is we can be so consumed by what's happening around us that we miss the greater glory that God, is, that, that God is doing and what he's about. Like, we exist for him. There, you know, I do have some, like, takeaways, some application points I want to share with you, but, but I, just don't, I just don't want us to miss this. Israel was so, so distracted by lesser glories that they, they missed the greater glory that God was doing in their midst. And we can be guilty of doing the same thing. So what do we learn from Ezra chapter 3? What do we learn from the Bible? <laughs> here, here are some, some application points, some takeaways that I want to share with you. One is that God is faithful on his terms, in his ways, and according to his character. That's how he operates. <laughs> like, not on our clock, on his. And uh, like, like what he did with Cyrus, he stirred in Cyrus's heart, my guess is nobody in Israel was aware of what God, or no, nobody who, who, who believed Israel was their homeland knew what God was doing in Cyrus's heart. But there was a promise, and God is a God who honors his promises. For you know, That Jeremiah passage, that, that prophecy, Jeremiah 29, for this is what the Lord says, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place for I know the plans that I have for you. By the way, this is the, the true context of that verse, by the way. I, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosper, pr prosperity 
and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And what is the future? The glory of God in, in, in flesh, in the person and work of his own son, and to be redeemed and to be, to be saved through him. And God was doing something there. God is faithful on his terms. Like he is more for you than anybody else on planet earth or in this world could ever be for you. But he's doing his thing in a way that only he can do. So he is faithful. And when, you're, when you doubt what, you know, his faithfulness, go to, the, go to the truth of Scripture that he is good, that God is good, and he's doing something here. Maybe you can't see all the details, and, maybe the, and, and, and granted, yeah, it really sucks right now, but, but he's good, and he's doing something in your life. Another takeaway is that the best way to fight fear is through faith in the God who is bigger than your problems. God is bigger than your problems. That's the story of the Bible, <laughs> from Genesis all the way through Revelation. He is bigger than your problems. You can go to him. Your response to the terrors that surround you should be worship, because he ultimately, it's in his hands. It's in, it's in his hand. He, he determines you know, the, the number of our days. He is the one who can heal, and he is the one who can deliver, and sometimes he chooses not to heal, and sometimes he, sometimes he chooses not to deliver, because he's good. You know, and one of the recommendations, one of the things I'll you know, suggest to you is that, that I do is <clears throat> you probably have seasons in your life where you're able to see God's hand in your life in some really good and miraculous ways. And when you're doubting his goodness, go back to those days. Revisit those days in your mind and in your heart. Like, that's what I love about chapter 3 here. The people fought their fear by remembering who God was. Third takeaway, the safest place to be is in the will of God. I, I don't know what's going to happen in our country. Uh, we could be in a world war, you know, a year, two, three, four, five years from now. But the safest place to be is in God's will. Follow the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Go where he goes. Stay where he stays. Don't follow lesser glories. Follow the cloud. Um, if you're not a Christian because you've not surrendered your life to Jesus, your first step is follow Jesus. Place your faith and trust in him. Believe that he lived the life you could never live and died a death that you deserve. And the worship team, you can come up as I, as I share this final, this final um, takeaway. And it's this. Beware of lesser glories. Beware of lesser glories. You know what they are in your life. Adam and Eve chased a lesser glory by believing the serpent's lie instead of the promise of God. Israel chased a lesser glory by making a golden calf, and they're known for worshiping idols and other gods. Solomon chased a lesser glory by uh, marrying many foreign women who turned his heart away from God. The, Hebrews of, the Hebrew people of Ezra's day, some of them chased a lesser glory or lesser glories because they were so stuck in the past or, or stuck with whatever dreams that they had that they couldn't see a greater glory, what God was doing in, in their midst. And there are lesser glories that threaten you today. Your idols of, the idols that reside in your heart. Maybe a relationship. Maybe the ideal job. Maybe a, the level, the amount of money you have in your bank account. Beware of lesser glories. Here's, here are other dangers for, you know, in terms of the lesser glory thing. Anything that puts Jesus second is a lesser glory. A relationship, a child, a job is a lesser glory if it puts Jesus second or places Jesus second. Any teaching that makes less of Jesus or what he has accomplished on the cross, listen, is a lesser glory. Beware of lesser glories. Thank you for listening to the Meadowbrook Church Podcast. For more information about our church, visit meadowbrook.org.